Welcome to this episode of the Professional Book Nerds Podcast. So Allie Hazelwood is the number one New York Times bestselling author of Love Theoretically and The Love Hypothesis, as well as a writer of peer-reviewed articles about brain science, in which no one makes out and the ever after is not always happy. Originally from Italy, she lived in Germany and Japan before moving to the U.S. to pursue a PhD in neuroscience. When Allie is not at work, she can be found running, eating cake pops, or watching sci-fi movies with her three feline overlords and her slightly less feline husband. We are chatting about her newest book, Bride, which comes out on February 6th. I hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, welcome Allie Hazelwood. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for joining me today on this episode of the Professional Book Nerds Podcast. So we are here to talk about Bride, your fifth published book. Can you tell our listeners what Bride is about? Yes. So Bride is my first uh, uh, paranormal romance, and it's the story of uh, uh, a vampire woman who ends up being stuck in a marriage of convenience with a werewolf um they are you know in in this alternative universe the the two species are at war and uh, uh, this marriage the idea is that the marriage is going to kind of patch things uh, uh between the two species and uh, can you hear my cat meowing like uh, no i can't <laughs> She's outside of like, and she is literally meowing like I have never given her love once uh, in her <laughs> yeah. life. And, yeah, I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> That's okay. My dog does the exact same thing. It's only when I'm recording or like on camera, he's making more noise than he's ever made in his life. <laughs> it's like, how dare you think about things that are not me for? Even a second. Exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, that's that's what Bride is about, really. <laughs> Mostly yeah. a marriage of convenience story. And so, yes, this is your first foray in publishing into the paranormal romance sort of mm -hmm. sphere. Where did you first come up with the idea for this sort of paranormal story? So, um, I really, really wanted to write a faded mates book, uh, something that, you know, would have this idea that two people are just meant to be together um, and uh, that there are kind of like a genetic or, you know, magic or, you know, destiny related reasons uh, for which they have to be together. And, and um, you know, it's a trope that you can't really... Uh, I guess you can have the faded, mate, faded mates tropes in a contemporary book but I don't know that it works as well and so um I think that's how it started I wanted to write something like that yeah I think that's such a good point that the faded mates sort of seems to have more impact when it's like more magical or like out of our hands maybe <laughs> absolutely yeah and so what did the writing process look like for you for this book? Because I know that you do have a pretty intense publishing cadence. I mean, we've got like one to two books a year. So how long did it take for you to write this book? And what was that like? So I wrote it, you know, usually it takes me about six months to write a book from the moment where, um, you know, I start drafting it to the moment where like I actually turn into my editor and you know I I feel like I have fixed it enough <laughs> that I can show other people uh the way uh, the show show the book to other people um so yeah usually like six months um it changes a little bit but it, it feels like I my my publishing schedule is incredibly hectic and that I have um and that I have uh, a lot of stuff going on but the truth is that um i had a lot of books pre-written when i started publishing and a lot of those kind of ended up coming out you know like twice a year so it feels like it's a lot but i am not really a very fast writer in truth 
But that's interesting to know just sort of, right, like where um, you are in sort of your publishing journey and then sort of the differences, obviously, if you had books already written and now that you've had several come out already, like just what that process is like a few years into being a published author. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's actually, I didn't know this before publishing or before I was in publishing, but there is a lot of time that goes between the moment where you turn in a book and the moment where the book comes out. And it's, uh, it's actually something that has been a, lot, a little bit weird for me because uh, um, the books that I am very excited about usually are books that I just finished or that I am writing in that moment. And then they don't come out until, you know, one, one and a half years later. And you're like, hmm, um, I'm like, I don't even care. I don't even remember anymore what I wrote. I'm like writing something else. My taste has changed. So it's a little bit weird sometimes, uh, um, but yeah, uh, I, I remember I was super excited about announcing Bride when last year um, in the in the summer I was on tour to promote uh, Love Theoretically, which was my last uh, adult book that came out, and I really really wanted to announce it, and my team was like, "No, we're gonna announce it later. It's not the time yet." And all I wanted to do was talk about that book. And now I'm like, well, Bride was a year ago, so <laughs> I don't care anymore. <laughs> no, but that's so true. Uh, but certainly in publishing, like where we talk about this, like w- this book has not yet come out. It is a week or so, a little more than a week away from actually coming out. And right, like you wrote this eons ago, like you're already on to the next or even the next thing. And so, yeah, publishing is such an odd process where yeah, who knows absolutely. where we're at in the timeline. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it's not what I expected when I started, I think, or when I was outside of it, I just thought, you know, an author would turn in a book and it would come out a month later. Right. Exactly. It looks like in movies, they usually like in movies, you have them like turn in the book to the editor and then literally two weeks later, it's in bookstores. <laughs> exactly. And so you, there's not that long wait, but right. Like you wrote this a very long time ago and we're just now going to have it in readers' hands in a couple of weeks time. Mm-hmm. Now you are known for writing really intelligent and sort of witty heroines. Misery has, um, Misery, our main character here, has bite to her in more than one way. And so I'm interested to know how you approached writing the character of Misery Lark. Right. So I think uh, I really wanted to write someone who has had the kind of past uh, that sort of uh, made her get to the point where she doesn't really care very much about anything. Um, And, uh, you know, I, I think if you take a character and uh, you put them in a, um, uh, in a situation where they literally have uh, no way of, uh, um, like, here's the deal. So Misery is in a situation where either she is going to be super badass because, you know, she is among her enemies. So either she's going to be incredibly strong and uh, she's going to have the upper hand or she is going to be absolutely terrified um, and I just don't know that I didn't really want to write either either character. Like, I didn't want her to be the most competent, most amazing, most brave person. And I just didn't want her to be, like, very meek and scared and terrified and just, like, kind of, um, you know, hiding in a room. And so I just kind of decided to write someone who's a little bit in the middle. So she has a past uh, where she was the collateral for the vampires in human territory for many years. So basically she was there to ensure that if there was a war, um, um, the uh, the humans had her uh, present uh, in their territory and they would have killed her immediately. So it, she was a deterrent uh, that would make it so that the vampire wouldn't start a war with the humans. And that means that, you know, she has grown up among people who absolutely hate her. She is, uh, um, she has been the victim of, you know, many assassination attempts uh, and uh, she sort of has graduated to the point where she just doesn't care about it. Like, she's like, you know what? I think... I think uh, I am just going to go ahead and do uh, and live my life. Um, and but, but there is this one person that she cares about who's her best friend, Serena, and she is kind of like the driving force uh, um, for her. But 
aside from that, she's neither super badass nor super scared. And it was kind of fun to write this character who is, you know, trying, like, has a lot of feelings on the one Uh hand about where she is, but on the other, she's not excessively, um, I don't know, um, confrontational or scared. Um, I I just kind of want her to be somewhere in the middle. Yeah. And I think that you did a wonderful job at that because she definitely has growth where certain things happen throughout the course of the book. But then also you can tell that there are moments where, right, she just is used to being in these types of situations that are nerve wracking or dangerous and her sort of snark comes out a little bit, which I found really, really entertaining to read some of her sort of snippy comments or some of her internal monologue there um, as she sort of progresses through the story. Yeah, I think it kind of comes from not caring too much about whether you live or not. And Mm -hmm. it's easier to like see things with humor if you if you're like, well, if I die, I die, I guess. And, you know, she doesn't have a lot to lose at the beginning of the book um, because, uh, you know, because of her past, because she just doesn't have very many relationships. She's, I think she's kind of, uh, um, I, I kind of surviving. Um, and, uh, that's why I, yeah, that's why it's, it's fun. Uh, it's fun to have a character like that because she's not going to be, you know, terrified. She's gonna be like, well, I guess I'm, I guess I'll die. That's fine. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And I think that that's a really good point because as like the collateral, she was collateral for many, many years growing up. I think she must be used to just sort of being in like pause. She wasn't there to do anything of her own accord or Mm -hmm. like pursue school or do anything like that. She was literally just there to be collateral. And so after that's over, Mm -hmm. what does she want to do? Um, and we learn a little bit about what that is. We won't spoil it yet, but um, it, yeah, it was, she's a really interesting character. And so in contrast to Misery, we have Low Moreland, who is our alpha werewolf. So I'm interested to know if you had like three words you would use to describe Low. <laughs> Maybe other than alpha. <laughs> yeah, um, I would say he is... Uh... Uh, selfless. Um, he is uh, protective, uh, and uh, he is. It's not a word, but better technology, maybe. Yes, <laughs> which is um, I thought a really fun contrast where misery has lots of technological skills and computer skills. Um, sort of in contrast with his inability to Google. <laughs> yeah, I, I really like the idea of him being a little bit of like an artist, like more like his soul is the soul of an artist and she is more of a like hard science girl. Um, and I, I, I like the idea of them being kind of complementary in this, in the sense that, um, you know, he can use her skills uh, um, and she can use his. So that was fine, right? I feel like I've never written an artistic main character and I would like to at some point. Yeah, he so yes, Lo is very dreamy. He has seemingly lots of interests and talents and it was really fun to learn more and more about what those are as the story sort of goes along because he's quite mysterious when we're getting a lot of the things from Misery's perspective. Without giving anything away, we did mention faded mates already as the trope and sort of the inspiration for this story. Are there any other tropes that readers can look forward to in Bride? You know, I I really wanted to write kind of like a fish out of water story, but not too much. I think um, I actually had a conversation with my editor because my editor really wanted to use the enemies to lovers um, uh, kind of you know, trope as, uh, um, like, for publicity, for uh, marketing or whatever it is that they use it for. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying, I wouldn't say that this is necessarily an enemies to lovers book because they are on different sides of a war. So, I mean, yes, they are quintessentially enemies, but they are both kind of, um, I would argue, they are people who are not 
excessively proud of being their species and that they uh they are not so entrenched in specific ideologies where they're like oh well our vampires are terrible or werewolves are terrible i i kind of liked the idea of them being a little bit stand of them standing out a little bit from um you know uh especially compared to the people around them because you know because of their past because misery grew up with another species and uh, species and because uh, low um grew up not in the us uh, so in a place where the different species are a little bit more integrated um so i i, I would say it's a little bit of a different take on enemies to lovers i definitely wanted to have uh, um kind of like uh, you know, Low is a little bit of a caregiver. Um, it's it, I wouldn't say it's the single dad trope, but he takes care of his younger sister, and uh, I that that's I, I knew I wanted like a child in in the book. I think I I I thought that that would be fun to write, and it would be fun to have a character like Misery, who is not someone who's gonna like baby talk to children. She's not someone who's gonna have any patience for children. She's gonna treat a child like they are an adult. Because uh, uh, because that's what happened to her. People would treat her like an adult when she was a child. They would put her at risk and uh, she almost got killed. So she's just going to do the same. But, you know, even though she really does not want to bond with this child, with Lo's little sister, she she does. Like, she just, it's, it's beyond her, her ability to do that. So that was something that I really wanted in the story. And I think that, yeah, absolutely. Those are some of the tropes that I think readers are going to be ecstatic to see some of these elements in this story. I hope so. And now Misery does agree to marry sort of her mortal enemy, um, you know, sight unseen at the start of the story. And that's sort of where everything else unfolds. We find out a little bit behind, we find out more about the motivations about why Misery would agree to this and why Lo would agree to this. And so I'm interested to know how it was for you sort of crafting the mystery element to this story. So, you know, what was that like to incorporate those threads throughout the, the story that's you know, primarily got the romance at the forefront and then you have their other motivations behind the scenes. Yeah, it was, honestly, there was a lot of like back and forth for me. So I wrote, I remember writing the first draft and then being like, uh, I'm gonna have to rewrite this <laughs> in a way that actually makes sense because, you know, it's kind of hard. I, I had an idea of what I wanted. So there are a lot of there are a lot of things that are not supposed to be twists. Like, I think, uh, you know, I would be surprised if people are not able to guess who who the bad people are uh, from the beginning. Um, and then there are, there's a, there's like, you know, a twist, a specific twist that I, I knew I wanted from the beginning and that sets up other things. Um, and uh, that was, you know, a little bit harder to kind of wave in and make sure that, you know, there would be kind of like some some groundwork for that, but also that it would come as a surprise. I am not a mystery writer, a thriller writer. I, I read them a lot and I love them, but like I literally have no idea how to do that. So I hope it worked and I hope it works for people, but um, definitely there was a lot of like trial and error and going back and like, you know, having these weird mental maps where I was like, okay, so people think this and other people think that. And then you have three species and then within the species, there are different factions. And then you're like, oh, what, what do I do? And I also have to admit, I am not a big, like I, I read Sam fantasy, but like, um, it's very hard for me to keep up with complex world building. <laughs> So I really wanted to keep the world building to a minimum just so that it can, so that it could really like just be the, the, in the, in the background of the love story. So there was that to think about too. Um, it's one of those things where like you write it and in your head it makes sense, but then you're like, will people like it? Will, will it resonate to them? I don't know. No, we'll see, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, but I think that that's a really interesting perspective to know just in how you were writing it, that there are certain things that are not meant to be like huge twists mm -hmm. because you know, the primary point of the story is the romance between misery yeah. and low. Yeah. Yeah. That's making me, th I'm like, oh, okay. I also think for this, I wanted to ask you about the world building because obviously werewolves and vampires and all of those things 
we've seen them in many different adaptations and we've seen different interpretations of what that even means. And so I was interested in how you decided to sort of take more of a like biological approach to the werewolves and the vampires. And, and it's, it's interesting to hear that you did just want it to sort of complement the circumstances of the story and not be too like we're building a huge and intricate world. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. That's that's where I, I was at. And I think it's because when I think about my favorite paranormal romance um, novels, uh, I mean, actually, I would argue that people like Nalini Singh or Cressley Cole, they definitely have like these sprawling words. But like at the same time, you can tell that those are romance novels, that mm -hmm. the most important thing is, okay, you have this thing in the backdrop, which is, you know, usually different species and different, you know, sometimes magic creature, sometimes there is no magic system, it really depends. And then like in the backdrop, like when that's the backdrop, then you're going to have a lot of opportunities to bring people together in like original and in original ways or in ways that you wouldn't be able to, like conflicts that you wouldn't be able to have if it was um, a contemporary romance. So that was that was really fun um for me. I you know, I um I think if you write magic and you know the paranormal in in your world, um you have to create one that is very consistent. Otherwise people are like, "Oh, you're just making up stuff." <laughs> and I think that's why I I just decided to go with something that was as as simply biological as possible and then once i i had that idea it was kind of you know you can just make your decision everything goes so one of the things that i did was you know looking at stuff that is possible in uh, you know the animal kingdom so there are you know there are species that have mostly purple blood and species that have uh, more green blood and so i can just you know apply that to one of the species if i want to so i it, it was kind of fun because I could just do whatever I wanted. Um, I it, it, it was different from what I usually do where I have to like research a lot and be like, okay, well, I'm writing a book, a book about chess. So what is visible and possible in in the real world about chess? But I can I can make up that vampires have, you know, pointy ears. I can't, no one can, no one can forbid me from doing it. So that was really fun in a way. Yeah, no, and I, I actually really, really enjoyed those elements of the story, just sort of learning what choices, you know, existed in, in this sort of realm, like what it meant to be a vampire, what color their blood was, what their features were, whether they would like explode in the sunlight or not. And I really thought, I thought that was one of the most fun parts of the book was discovering sort of all of those decisions and like the mythology of this world that you created. and. I'm glad. I enjoyed that it was also very contemporary. Like we're Googling, we're using coding, we're doing all of these things. But right, there is sort of that like, again, a little bit of paranormal fantastical element where they have more strength or um, thrawling. If, if I'm remembering yeah, that yeah. correctly. Was, so. I, I think I was halfway through, or I was writing, and there was a point when I was like, I feel like the vampires don't have enough cool stuff going on. <laughs> I need to give them something new. I really enjoyed that sort of, fun, like, just, again, learning what that mythology was in the world of Bride. I thought it was a lot oh, of fun. Mad. I it's It's, I don't really, like, read reviews, so all the feedback I get is, like, you know, this so it's nice to know that one person like <laughs> no it, I thought it was so much fun just to be sort of immersed in this world right where we're learning how everything works mm -hmm. and what everything means now I'm interested to know what you think again this is a little bit of a hard question without spoiling the entire plot of the book um, but what do you think Low and Misery's biggest obstacle is when we meet them in Bride oh well yeah, and like you say, it's hard to to say this without spoiling, but I think, uh, I guess this could be a little bit of a spoiler, but uh, mostly, and it's something that they talk about, they really have like different hardwares, like, um, you know, Faded Mates is a trope that is part of the book, but uh, not every species has the concept of faded mates. And, you know, like in, in, in that book, the idea of faded mates is not something 
necessarily magical is more of something that is biological and what happens if you don't have if one of the two people has the biological hardware um to know okay you are the person that i'm meant to be with and i will never not love anyone else and the other person just doesn't have that like how do you yeah. deal with this imbalance and that was something that like was very very fun for me to play with like the idea that you can have uh, you know a meaningful relationship even if uh, you know, not it's it's not gonna be the same for both people because uh, the process of falling in love is gonna be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think what like what you said is giving them that choice to to make it work or not um, within that trope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is uh, gonna be a little bit of a spoiler, so I don't know, listeners, a little bit of a spoiler. <laughs> One of the things that I really, really wanted to write, and I don't know what that says about me, but I, I really love the idea of someone who identifies the other person as their fitted maid, but instead of going all possessive, I cannot live my life without you. They're like, well, I love you so much and you're so important to me that I want you to be able, like you said, to make that choice. And I really, really wanted to write something like that just because... I don't know. I, I, it's, it's the selflessness of it all that just feels so. You know, I, I, I like mafia romance in which you know guys chain women to the radiator <laughs> as much as anyone else. <laughs> but sometimes you really want uh, kind of like you know the, the feeling of someone who's just like such a good guy. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Right. Well, and right, giving everyone in the relationship the freedom to make those choices, even with some of these added elements sort of in play. I really yeah. loved that that part of the story as well. In <laughs> this may not this may be because I, as a reader, am not the most versed in paranormal um romance or in sort of the Omega verse or anything like that. So there were a few elements to the story that surprised me <laughs> and that I had to do some googling on. <laughs> Is there anything that readers should? research or go into this knowing or should we the, just dive right in you know i mean if you want to google omegaverse i wouldn't i don't know if this is an actual omegaverse book like omegaverse comes from with a specific set of like rules but it definitely has omegaverse elements especially in the way the sex happens um what would I say? I a good you could read The Fake Mate by Lana Ferguson, which is a book that came out recently. My same publisher. It's it's a really fun, really like it's an amazing story and an amazing book. It's a uh, tonally, it's like kind of a fun rom com, but it has some Omega verse um, stuff, and that might be you know I, I think you would enjoy yeah. it as well. But like uh, that might be good. Um, research I guess yeah <laughs> but also just generally I would say that if you have been on AO3 or fanfiction.net if you have been in those spaces you probably know what I'm talking about um and uh, if not you can I think you can skip the sex scenes <laughs> I mean if, if, if the idea doesn't if the idea upsets you you can probably skip the sex scenes and uh, um, I I don't know. It's uh, it, it's something that like the that bio that biological part is definitely something that um, was a big part of uh, fan fiction culture when I was coming up in fan fiction and learning to write. And it was definitely something that I was like, I want to bring this into traditional publishing with me. I don't want to say goodbye to that. And that was so fun to actually be able to write it and to have my editor not say that's it, you're fired. <laughs> yeah. No. So I think listeners and readers, you can absolutely just read this without any background knowledge, <laughs> but you can certainly do additional research if you are intrigued to know more uh, like I was. <laughs> and I'm sure, like, again, I'm not on Goodreads, but I am 100% sure that someone on Goodreads will be like, this is what it is. Well, so if, if, if you... <laughs> It, yeah, right. That, that might that might be a will help outline yeah. absolutely. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> no, and um, don't skip the sex scenes because they were great. Um, Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Now, taking a total pivot, um, in the story, siblings 
and found family are very important to both of our main characters, Misery and Lo. And so I wanted to know why it was important for you to explore those themes of, you know, sibling relationships and dynamics and found family in the book. Yeah, I I just really, um, I feel like when you give a character something or someone that they really care about, that's when... I don't know. For me, that's when I really start loving a character. It's uh, it's when um, it's when they people would say save the cat. There is this book that is called Save the Cat writes a book, uh, and basically the idea is that it, it's a book about craft that tells you how to write a story. And the idea is that you have to have the character has to save the cat, and by that, what I mean is that even if the character is very very unlikable, um, they have to do something that shows that they are deep down people who are not not necessarily good but like relatable and for me the most relatable thing in a character is caring you know and the the fact that the fact that um misery cares so much about her friend that she's literally the only reason she makes life decisions like that's she's the it's yeah. the one thing that has been, you know, a constant through her life and she will do whatever it takes to find this person. And, you know, Lo as well, he has given up, he, you know, he had an, a life elsewhere and he has given up that life because, uh, because of what the needs of his sister were. And I, I think for me, that was, first of all, a way to make the characters likable and relatable, but also like a way to make them um, relate to each other because they have this thing in common where they just love, love, love these two people in their world. And, you know, as the book goes on, you find out that these two people are even more connected than than you would think. And so, you mm-hmm. know, I, I, like the, I, I like the idea of exploring that. Yeah, absolutely. And I loved seeing the contrast, like Misery has a brother, um, you know, and Lo has a sister, but those aren't right with the differing ways that siblings can sort of play a role in your life. And again, what importance you place on the people that you're related to versus those found family. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, I, I wouldn't say like uh, um, her brother, uh, he was actually a late addition. Like he, there, there, he, she didn't have a brother originally. Like uh, um, it was, I think I was a, about a third through the book and I was like you know what I think she needs to have a brother <laughs> yeah um I think uh, so the, her brother is actually her twin and uh, it was really interesting in terms of adding an element of you know resentment but also like what her life could have been because her brother is her twin and he could have been chosen to be the collateral but wasn't so there is a, a like a, an element of misery being like you know what screw that <laughs> like it could have been anyone else, but it was me, and I'm mad about it. And uh, um, yeah, it, it was very fun to also write kind of that that thing. And it's something that permeates their relationship. There is a little bit of resentment on her part, and on his part, there is you, you find out as the story goes on that there is a little bit more than just uh, I don't care about you and I don't know you because you grew up in another place. There is a little more. I really enjoyed Owen and uh, his interactions. And so speaking of, he's obviously a part of the story. We see him off and on. We see other characters, a low sister, Anna, um, and Alex, who's a member of the Wolf Pack. I'm wondering if you had a favorite character sort of outside of our two main characters in this story. It was really fun to write Quinn. He is, uh, he's the best friend, like the, yeah. the, kind of best friend kind of father figure kind of you know he's a, he's another alpha for a neighboring pack which is also the pack where Lo grew up uh because it was uh, because of reasons that you find out in the book and he's kind of like this horrible person <laughs> in a way like he's just very brash and uh he just says without everything that he thinks of without a filter it was really fun to write him um and then, I mean, I guess Anna. Anna is a little sister. She is. Uh, it was just fun to write her because she is. I think uh, she really makes uh, the character of Misery come alive. She's uh, again. She's this person that Misery does not want to care for, but ends up caring for. And she's like, "Damn it, I hate it." Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, and yeah, it was really fun to write her. That's inter- So that's interesting that you said that. And I will cut this if we're not allowed to talk about it or if I'm not allowed to ask. 
but this book shows some potential that we may see other characters in this world in other books. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and I know what you're, what you're asking. So the truth is, I don't know if we will, like I hope we will, but uh, you know, with publishing, it depends a lot on whether the book will do well and whether people want a sequel. <laughs> so I think yeah, uh, depending on that, we'll see. But um, I would love to, and I have, you know, a story in my head. And uh, um, I also, one of the characters, especially, is a character who I think needs some happiness and needs, uh, you know, to have uh, kind of their story told and uh, to have uh, kind of like, it's, it's just a character who has not had a good experience within the book. So I would love to write better happier things for them yeah well i would love to see that so that is just one person's vote i i will tell my pop <laughs> thank you and so um i know that we are very excited about bride it comes out on february 6th i do love to ask this though because we have talked about publishing the schedule is all over the place is there anything that you're working on currently that you're allowed to talk about um, I'm I'm writing a book right now um, again, <laughs> <I'm writing laughs> and that would be my so my my next book uh, is gonna be not in love and it's gonna be out in June and uh, that's been announced uh, and it's done. Um, but um, the book I'm writing right now is I I don't know I don't know that I can talk about it and say mm -hmm. what it is. It's another one of the situations where it hasn't been accepted yet. Um, mm -hmm. because it's, I haven't even turned it in because I'm late. <laughs> but <laughs> it's another situation where um, I feel like uh, I feel like uh, it could be a thing where my editor is like, no, it doesn't really work, and and it ends up not coming out, and then I have to, you know, self-publish it two years down the line. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, that's why I'm I'm a little hesitant uh, mm -hmm. with talking about it. But it's a little bit yeah. of a different book for me. It still has like some a stem, a little bit of a stem aspect, but it's not the primary aspect. Um, the characters are a little bit younger, but it's an adult book. So yeah, I I that's that I feel like that's what I can say for now. <laughs> Well, that's absolutely okay. And I do love, so obviously you had your young adult uh, mm -hmm. book come out last fall, Chuck and Mate, and now you have your paranormal romance bride coming out in February. And I love to see that you're doing, you know, different genres or different like mm -hmm. audiences and just sort of exploring um, because the writing and the characters are fantastic, no matter the setting. Thank so <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think it's because coming from fan fiction, I feel like I, um, I don't know, uh, fan fiction is very whatever goes. And, you know, if you have an idea for a story, you just start writing it and you post it online. And, um, you know, that's kind of how I am seeing publishing as well. Like, I'm just kind of going by what I want to write at a specific moment. Um, uh, I, maybe I get bored easily. I don't even know. But Yeah. <laughs> For Bride, I'm wondering if there's anything that you're most looking forward to when the book comes out and sort of for book tour. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually not really going on, on a book tour, but I will be doing my launch, my virtual launch um, um, in uh, like a with a Barnes & Noble thing. And I'm actually very excited about it because uh, it's going to be with uh, uh, CEO Axel Road, who has uh, um, a book out, which is... Uh, uh, women with bad reputation um it's out that day and uh, it's it's fantastic it's like kind of a, kind of a rock star a rock star romance about like a drummer and the bus driver it's fantastic and then also with nisha j tuli who has okay she has multiple books com coming out but like she has a fantasy romance i think i believe she's self-publishing it um that month coming out and so um I'm, I'm really excited about just uh, um yeah hanging out with them um and then the following day I think I have another virtual event with Lynn Liao Butler who also has a book coming out the following day she's a thriller writer so I'm I'm excited about that um I'm not gonna be touring in person because uh I am very late with <laughs> <laughs> with my other books that I should be writing yeah, well, too much going on. Too slow. 
I did just see my invitation in my email to the Barnes and Noble virtual event since ah. I am subscribed to those. So it was funny right before this. I was like, ooh, yes. <laughs> I actually, like I literally, every time I talk about, like I just saying it to you, I'm like, I just remember that they asked me to post about it on Instagram and I completely forgot. Because- Speaking of which, is there a place that our readers and listeners can find you where you're most active and, and post for updates and things like that? Yeah, definitely Instagram. I have a website, alihazelville.com that I, um, I want to say update um, with some frequency that is not specified. <laughs> And then uh, I sometimes uh, am on TikTok, depending on whether there is, uh, you know, something that I'm interested in looking at. We could be, you know, salt burn stuff or <laughs> tapes or, or whatever, or succession memes. And uh, if I am there, I will sometimes post videos, but um, I will go months and months forgetting to post. So really, um, for updates, I would say Instagram is my my most uh, my most reliable place. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. And now as we sort of wrap up, is there anything that you would want readers to take away from Bride in the story with misery and low? You know, really just a couple of hours of, you know, having fun or just not, th- if you have a problem, if you have some issues, if you're feeling down, just a couple of hours where you're not focusing on that and kind of get the opportunity to to be happy or even like be angry even if you hate the book if it distracts you from something bad that is going on in your life I will consider my job done so (laughs) no that's perfect and I think that this book absolutely fits the bill I was like kicking my feet a little bit at certain parts of this book (laughs) I'm so glad Oh, well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me about Bride. It's been such a delight getting to know you a little bit more and hearing about this book. Thank you so much. It's been so fun. Readers can sample and borrow the titles mentioned in today's episode on Overdrive.com and our library friends can purchase these titles in Marketplace. Professional Book Nerds is proud to be an Evergreen Podcast signature program. To learn about other Evergreen Podcasts, visit evergreenpodcast.com. Our podcast is produced, recorded, and edited by Emma Dwyer and Joe Skelly and presented by Overdrive. To learn more, visit professionalbooknerds.com.